Good morning and welcome to the British Skydiving Annual General Meeting of 2021. My name is Craig Poxon and it has been my privilege to be chair of our association for the past year. I'm really sorry we can't all be together in person to do this, but since this is my first AGM as chair, it's saving me a fortune on the beer fine. But it's everyone's first AGM online as well, so I think that cancels them out, right? Wow, tough crowd. For those of you who are not familiar with my fellow board members, with the fellow board members and the executive staff who should be accompanying me on the screen, I would like to introduce you to them, them to you. We have Adrian Bond, Vice Chair, Natasha Higman, Treasurer. We also have Tony Butler, Chief Operating Officer, and Lisa Moore, Company Secretary. Firstly, some admin. You should have received an email yesterday regarding the AGM, including details about how you can vote on the resolutions. And it's on that site where the relevant documents for the meeting are to be found. Those documents include an agenda for today, our articles of association, last year's draft minutes, the annual report and accounts, they should have also been sent out in the magazine, a document on membership subscriptions, and the independent non-executive directors profiles. This is being broadcast on YouTube and there should be a chat facility where questions can be asked. Please make sure you use your real name and I will attempt to answer them. I'd appreciate your understanding that this is not the best medium for a detailed discussion, especially as the questions are being relayed to me, so please bear that in mind. Perhaps if you intend to ask a question, Signal quickly so we don't move on and then type the rest of the question or have it ready to copy and paste. Because this year our AGM is online, we've had to adopt online voting. This was open for submitting proxies from the 15th until the 28th of this month. And thank you for the 200 or so members that did submit their proxies. The site has now reopened for live voting during these proceedings and you'll have the link in the email that you received yesterday. It will remain open until five minutes after the formal part of today closes, whilst Adrian does the short awards presentation. It will then take 15 minutes for the results to be collated and announced. I'm assured everything has been tested, but you may wish to try logging in now to ensure you have access. Be aware the site will time out if left, although you will be asked if you wish to extend your session. If there are any issues, please email UK Engage on British Skydiving at uk-engage.org or give them a call on the number on the screen now. This is today's agenda. I shan't go into too much detail as I'll cover each point as we go along. Item two, apologies for absence. Everyone, I think, whilst the law has been extended to permit online AGMs, when national restrictions prevent people from traveling and gathering, I'm still not quite sure whether a virtual audience counts towards attendance or not. Anyway, I've not received any official ones, so we'll move on. Declarations of any conflicts of interests. Um, this might be a fun one virtually. Uh, I guess you have to declare it in the chat window and abstain from any re relevance resolution. Item number four, approve the minutes from last year's annual general meeting. Any questions? This is our first resolution for voting upon. So push those buttons now. Anyone remember that? I'm so old. OK, highlights of the year 2020 and a summary of Council's future strategy. This is my chance to tell you a little bit about what we've been up to this year as an association and our future strategy. We are fortunate that skydiving fatalities in this country are a very unusual occurrence, but notwithstanding the events of the year and the concomitant reduction in jumping, I am of course still very relieved to be able to say that this year there have been no deaths from parachuting. One might think that the interruption to our sport and the lack of currency that comes with it would have resulted in an increase in the injury rate. But no, we've seen a marked reduction. 
One of the benefits of the new membership system, PIMS, is that we can now analyse biometric data supplied for our provisional members. And whilst we do not have any historic data for comparison that is easily examined, we believe it is down to a reduction in numbers of the more vulnerable, relatively speaking, who might therefore statistically also have a higher risk of injury, refraining from jumping. Sadly, however, the following members have passed away. Sue Dixon, Andy House, Spike Robe, Pete Tuskins, Doc Flynn, Tony Bone Smith, Kenny Leader, Nick O'Brien, Kevin Whittle, Potter, Bob Charters, Martin Howland, Bob Souter, Charles Henley, Phyllis, Marius Frangus, Russ George, Ian Mac McTavish, Bryn Jones, Alex Scott, Gordon Cooper. Please join me in one minute silence whilst we remember those who are no longer with us. Thank you. A number of those lost were COVID related. Whilst it's been a hard year for skydiving, nothing compares to the suffering of losing loved ones to this terrible virus, which many of our, in our skydiving family have endured this year. This has been such a difficult year for everyone. Please remember, it's okay to not be okay. And if you're struggling and who isn't, please seek help. I don't need to tell you the devastation coronavirus has wrought upon the world, the millions of deaths, economic calamity and the harm to everyone's mental well-being. I can remember being at the East Midlands Conference Centre this time last year for the Expo, when we were already receiving reports of the impact it was having in Wuhan, China. But I think few of us could have envisaged that we would be where we are now. Last year, my predecessor Martin talked about our strategy and successes more of which I will cover later. But one of the things he mentioned, more than once in fact, was our financial stability. This year that stability has been sorely tested, but thanks to the diligence of our previous treasurer, Debbie Carter, and the stewardship of council over the years, we have built our reserves over time to provide that stability. To most of our members, skydiving is a sport, a hobby, a bit of fun, but for a number, it is their livelihood. The arrival of the coronavirus was a per perfect storm coming off the back of a winter and a bad one at that, where cash flow as well as at bank and in hand is traditionally very low. With a significant reduction in income from memberships, we disinvested a large chunk of our reserves to be able to continue operating. Many of you may not have heard of the Drop Zone Defence Fund. It was set up to offer financial support for legal action to those that were suffering existential threat to their operations. The fund is financed 
much like the one for the British team, via donations from members. Fortunately, it has not been needed for many years and a sum of almost £35,000 was sitting idle in the bank. The ethos of the th fund is that it would match pound for pound money that was spent by drop zones on legal fees. After consultation with one of its instigators, Vice President John Lyons, it was agreed that it would be appropriate to use the money to award grants to qualifying parachute training organisations in most need. To honour the original ethos, British Skydiving matched the fund, doubling it to £70,000. 12 grants of £5,000 were made, totaling £60,000. Making donations to our support funds is one of the things that did not make it into PIMS initially, but it should be back in time for renewals. The fund is almost depleted and we may well need to call on it again soon, so please help if you can. I've been receiving proxies from members for this AGM and true story, one of them included a note asking if it would be possible for those fortunate enough to be in the position to be able to and wish to pay the full amount for their renewal rather than re receive the discount. I'm afraid that might be a bit complicated to set up, but if you feel so inclined, please use the donation option to make up the difference when renewing. We also allocated an extra £300,000 for loans to qualifying PTOs, of which approximately £86,000 remains. Those loans were offered with the extremely favourable conditions of 0% interest with repayment commencing only when significant operations had restarted and commensurate with previous turnover. The loans are secured under what is known as a chattel mortgage, that is against items of movable property. This is not so that the association can call in the loans and hamper a business's operation by depriving them of their vital equipment, but to ensure that should the worst come to the worst, the association and its members can recoup some of the loss. Some say that we as an association did not react fast or generously enough to those PTOs at risk. Indeed, there was a movement to raise a special resolution for the membership to vote on regarding the allocation of reserves that ultimately did not happen. Perhaps there is some truth in that, but the board were doing their best in difficult circumstances. And as it happens, currently, thankfully, no PTOs have gone out of business, either from securing their own commercials themselves operating between lockdowns or with financial assistance from British skydiving or a combination thereof. Whilst one of the objects of the association, according to our articles, is to protect the interests of sport parachuting, equally they state that reserves shall be created for the continuation of the association. I hope you can appreciate the position in which that places the directors working to find that balance, and it is one that we do not take lightly. Without PTOs, there is no skydiving. But without a Civil Aviation Authority approved governing body, which British Skydiving is currently the only one, PTOs would not be able to operate. But we are not out of the woods yet. Fortunately, this current lockdown is occurring during the off season. When there will be little, if any, jumping. We do not know how long this will continue. And for now, it isn't looking great. Should it extend beyond the winter lull and into spring, PTOs will again be struggling, as will the association, and we may need to dip further into our reserves. Our treasurer and all the board will have their work cut out to rebuild that financial stability. But I have no doubt we are in very capable hands. And just to recap, we awarded six loans to six PTOs totaling £214,000 just over. So we have £86,000 left in that grant, in that, in that loan fund currently. In June 2020, a working group was formed to produce a set of guidelines for when skydiving could resume after the lockdown. They provided suggestions as to mitigate the risk of virus transmission during skydiving once they were again permitted activities. The members of the working group split up to cover three distinct topics, PTO entry, airside and non-airside activities. The working group was made up of a broad cross-section of our sport, from those in the running 
of the drop zones to those with scientific, aviation and industry expertise and members of council. I would like to thank all of those involved who gave up a considerable amount of their time and worked very rapidly to produce their findings. Thank you. I would like to say a massive thank you to the editor of our magazine, Liz Ashley. How she managed to put out six issues this year, as usual, albeit occasionally somewhat thinner due to a reduction in advertising, what with everything going on, including holding down a very demanding full-time teaching job at the best of times, let alone in the middle of a pandemic. But that's Liz for you. Although I'm sure she would say she could not have done it without all the contributors and Warners, our publishing partner. So thank you to all of you. I think it greatly helped keep our members connected with each other and the sports during this time, which also aids with our strategic goal of retention. And how about that new branding on the mag, hey? Last year saw a return to previous publishers, Warners, who made us an offer we could not refuse. Rather than us paying for the magazine and getting a cut of the advertising revenue on top of a certain amount, they would produce the magazine for free under Liz's editorship in exchange for the advertising revenue. Accepting their offer proved to be a very fortunate decision for us given what has happened. Although, as I said, we've made some concessions on number of pages and paper quality to assist them. And not to mention the financial struggles of our previous partners, Archon. The magazine is one of the many benefits of your membership. And whilst I appreciate it does not appeal to everyone, no member's money goes towards its creation now. Just the postage. You may have seen the social distance learning page on our website, put together by our communications manager, Angel Fernandez, where he created a collection of expo seminars, articles from the magazine and wider content from the skydiving world to keep members engaged. And I'd encourage you to take a look at it. A few thank yous. To the council members, firstly, Apples. 23 years on council, our longest serving member. Chair of Riggers, world champion mountain man, life member, ear bender, curmudgeon. I wish he wasn't going. Apples was on council when I first joined in 2001. I know, I know, I don't look that old. So I guess his leaving makes me the father of the board now, damn you. Adrian Bond, Mr Expo, Mr Art of the Deal, 15 years on council, chair of communications and vice chair for the past year. I'm sure Adrian is disappointed that he wasn't able to organise his Swan Song Expo, but he's kindly can offered to continue managing it even when he doesn't have to. He loves it that much. Thank you, Adrian. Jack Davis was only just elected last year, but because he was filling the vacancy left by a council member that had resigned, his tenure was for only what remained of their term, which was one year. Sadly, standing for re-election this year, he wasn't successful, which is a shame because he's been an extremely hardworking and productive member of council. I do hope that he will continue to volunteer his services to us. Sue Stanhope was one of our first two independent non-executive directors that joined us due to our adoption of the principles of good governance. Thank you, Sue, for giving us an invaluable perspective from outside the sport and helping us on our evolving journey. To the staff. Sue has been with the association for over 40 years. Working in membership services, she was one of the first points of contact for our members and never failed to make a good impression. Always helpful, always friendly, hardworking, super efficient and beloved by the membership. It feels sometimes that half of the goodwill for the association is a result of, re of interacting with Sue and Kerry. Sue was part of the family and it was a very sad day for everyone when she left in December. James Potts took on the role of compliance officer at the beginning of last year, whilst also starting his own business after leaving the police force and was doing a great job in very trying circumstances. His own business was taking up more and more of his time 
and he felt that he could not dedicate enough to British skydiving, so he sadly resigned at the end of the year. The position has been advertised with a good response, and three to four candidates have been shortlisted who will be interviewed soon. Marie Kent was our competitions and awards coordinator, for which the pandemic removed a lot of the workloads, and with uncertain prospects for 2021, sadly the position was made redundant. Fortunately, Marie was able to find employment quickly and we wish her every success. But we welcome back Megan Sheedy, who has previously held the competition's coordinator position before returning to her native Canada. She has now come back to the UK and is admirably attempting to fill the enormous gap in membership services left by Sue. And I should also Martin Sh mention Martin Shuttleworth, who's been off work unwell for the significant part of the year and is still recovering. I'm sure you will all join me in wishing him well. Whilst the staff have gone above and beyond covering his work in his absence, especially Lisa, Tony and Angel, none of us can replace Martin and we're desperate for him to return. Get well soon, Martin. The dedication of all our staff is outstanding and that has been especially apparent this year. We're extremely fortunate to have such loyal and committed employees and I cannot thank them enough. Let's review the strategic goals that were set for 2018 to 2022 and relate them currently. Firstly, firstly, engaging with our communities, which includes our major stakeholders, the biggest of which is our parachute training organisations. PTOs have for some time had a formalised route to raise issues and have their voices heard via the Drop Zone Owners and Operators Special Interest Group, which reports to the membership, the Membership Development Committee. This functional arrangement by no means diminishes their inherent significance. The SIG officially meets once a year, but there has been the option to, to meet more frequently should the need arise, as has happened in the past. We're currently planning to hold another meeting next month and have put a call out for the agenda items. Usually it would combine with the expo where we're all in the same place at the same time, but in the time of Zoom, this is not so critical anymore. The coronavirus pandemic has exacerbated issues between British skydiving and some PTOs to the point that a number, a majority even, have formed their own parachute training organisations association to have a say in the issues that affect them and work together with British skydiving. The executive of the PTOA have lobbied British skydiving on behalf of their members on several matters. I would consider a couple of those to be business as usual. Firstly, relating to instructor courses. There are practical issues such as backlog due to the year's shutdown and cancellation of courses, which is being addressed by our safety and technical officer, Jeff Montgomery. There have also been questions about the way that courses are implemented and delivered. The ongoing changes to the coaches ratings are laying the groundwork for the evolution of future instructor courses. And there have also been issues around PIMS that are being dealt with by Graham, Spicer, myself and Udinet. The other matters are far more significant. They have made suggestions relating to the way that the elements of membership subscriptions that fund all our functions are allocated, which would reduce our income, but would still wish to benefit from the myriad services that the association provides. Of course, we always appreciate new ideas and those wanting to help, especially when it comes to saving money. But from the information we've been given so far, the numbers don't appear to add up. The purpose of the association is to benefit all members and the proposals could result in some of our members and stakeholders paying significantly more for what was previously spread across the whole. To the point perhaps where it could become prohibitive, meaning that people might leave the sport or force us to slash discretionary spends that benefit our members. They have similar questions about our insurance coverage as well, with what we believe could be similar consequences. Of course, the devil is in the detail, and we might be wrong. This strategic goal is about engaging with our community, and we have offered to form joint working groups with the PTOA to thoroughly evaluate these propositions and consider all the ramifications but currently we're at a point where they have chosen not to engage with us any further, despite their stated aim of wanting to work together. The PTOs are as vital to the sport as is a national governing body. We understand it can be a frustrating process 
But if it isn't undertaken, then the rancor will fester, which isn't good for anyone. So our door remains open to try and resolve these rifts. Since the effects of such changes could be so wide ranging on our association and the sport, they would require considerable consultation with the members and would need to be voted on at an annual general meeting. Other significant community engagement last year included with the Civil Aviation Authority. CAP 660 is a document under the Air Navigation Order Statutes that sets out the minimum standards which the CAA require to be satisfied prior to the grant or renewal of parachuting permissions and any related exemptions. And to indicate the CAA's requirements for conduct of parachuting operations. <clears throat> it has been revised this year, which last happened in 2008, and as such there have been some major changes to reflect new legislation and regulatory provisions. Also, our exposition, a compliance assurance document that defines the organisation and procedures upon, our, upon which our CAA approval is based, has been updated. Thanks to Tony Knight, our CAA liaison, for all his hard work in these matters. Strengthening British skydiving. New directors, both elected and appointed, new volunteers and staff, all with the new skills, perspectives, enthusiasm, taking us forward. Enhance the perception of British skydiving. Two years ago, we saw the appointment of Angel Fernandez, our communications manager, and the effect he has had on our comms, especially our social media, is clear. I'm sure you will agree he's doing an excellent job, but he's also had to cope with a lot of unexpected stuff thrown at him this year. So watch this space. And this also ties in with the earlier community engagement goal such as with the public and the media. Assure the financial stability of British skydiving. As I said earlier, we are not out of the woods yet and have some work to do if we should wish to return to our former standing. I understand there's a question regarding this from YouTube. Do council intend to replace that money reserve in the future and if, and if so, how? And Natasha, our treasurer, says that she will cover that uh, at the end of her video. Represent British skydiving, both nationally and internationally. Sadly, there have been no official competitions this year, but the representation continues to happen through our liaisons with the CAA, the Royal Aero Club, Sport Recreation Alliance, Sport England, General Aviation Awareness Council, General Aviation Safety Council, the, and the International Skydiving Commission, and so on and so on. This is my third week on, on weekend online in a row, having spent the last two attending the open sessions and plenary of the ISC, along with our delegate and vice president, John Smythe, with, and with our treasurer observing. Uh, she also sits on, on, on the committees, on a committee for, at ISC. Oh, and Mikey Lovemore as well. Making British skydiving resilient having the right governance structures and meeting the legal requirements such as safeguarding and GDPR, etc. Last year we restructured our committees, but the technical ones, safety and training, the rigging subcommittee, pilots, SIG, etc., were ring fenced so as not to bite off more than we could chew, especially given their critical nature. It was the intention to address their organisation this year, but events overtook us which is regretful since it's been apparent this year that change is needed. So it is a matter of some urgency that they will be reworked this year. Some of the considerations to be made regard the makeup. Is it too large? Is the knowledge and experience of our other technical experts who are not chief instructors being overlooked? Are the conflicts of interest managed appropriately? I don't know, and I'm not an expert in these things, um, but we will seek them out and there are many other questions to be answered. With the adoption of good governance practices, the board has evolved over recent years. The upheaval of the last year has made us appreciate even more that we need to assess the staffing configuration of the whole association from top to bottom. We are understaffed as it is, so we're not looking to lose anyone, but is there a better way of working? Whilst Tony, our COO, isn't leaving us just yet, He's regrettably warned us of his intention to retire within the next couple of years or so. Tony's job has evolved over the years, 
but his focus and passion has always been on safety. He's taken on many other responsibilities that he has neither sought nor wanted for the sake of the association, and we thank him for doing that. And whilst it would be very difficult to envisage an association without the man to whom he has dedicated his whole life, but looking forward, it could raise some interesting possibilities to shake things up a little. Membership. Anyone who knows me will appreciate that I am a big fan of data and statistics. So one of our key performance indicators, membership size and number of descents would normally get me a bit excited, but not so much this year. Understandably, our membership numbers have taken a big hit due to the pandemic. Having said that, I'm still encouraged. We are extremely grateful to those who did choose to renew their membership this year in these extremely tough times. You have helped us to help the PTOs and you are assisting us with the strategic goal of ensuring the financial security of the association. Thank you. Those of you who did renew will benefit from a reduction in this year's membership. Thanks to the negotiation of our COO, Tony, the support of our broker, Romero, especially Martin Mansley, and the understanding of our insurance underwriters, AXA XL and Aspen, who have agreed to discount our policy during our enforced grounding. Our collective insurance policy is one of our greatest strengths as an association, spreading the risk across all our members. I understand we are facing the hardest insurance market in a long time. Lines of business are being restricted and non-standard cover is either not being quoted or the premiums are increasing. We are grateful that our premiums will remain the same from 2021 to 22. Sorry if I'm stealing your thunder, Tash. Students, again, I'm surprised by the number of student memberships, predominantly tandems, and even though the, typically the weather was amazing during lockdown and not so much once things started to get going again, it's a pretty good effort, especially in considering there are a number of drop zones that didn't reopen. The figure of just under 20,000 student members equates to approximately 36% of the previous 10-year average. Students trained, obviously a marked reduction, but interestingly, in terms of AFF, that number of 592 is 50 to 52% of the last 13 year average. Static line is 24% of the last 13 years average, but we, we understand that static line is declining. So if you compare it to the last year's numbers, it's 33% of last year. And tandem is 43% of the last 13 year average. And the descents, just under 100,000, and that equates to almost 40% of the previous 10 years average. Hopefully we'll be able to bump these up this year. A license is issued and the number of full members give it an indication of the turnover in our sport. Since our overall membership does not increase to the same extent as the number of new licenses awarded each year, which demonstrates the attrition. This year, we have not replaced those members. Hopefully, these are just delayed rather than lost for good. I've seen speculation in the media that whilst a lot of people are struggling, those that are fortunate enough to be working with nowhere to go during lockdown are paying off their debts and saving money regretting the things they always wanted to do, but didn't have the opportunity. And once we get back to normal, we'll be itching to spend that money, especially on experiences such as skydiving. Could there be boom times ahead? Let's hope so. But now more than ever, we must focus on the member journey if we are to recover. Last year, after a short term decline in numbers, Martin asked what the Royal We would be doing to retain and hopefully boost our members and he talked about our new personal information management system. We had replaced the aging membership system and websites, though we had yet to fully Im implement the membership portal, but it was online for the new membership year. One of the biggest benefits was the ability for those with ratings to renew online with a slick sign-off process. Whilst that 10% of membership 
was now brought into the digital age due to technical reasons another 10 percent of the membership joint members were not able to renew electronically whereas they had been before previously you win some you lose some i'm sure i'm assured that this will be resolved when renewals start in march anyway i digress back to membership trends and their influence Last year, we talked about introducing the ability to purchase student provisional memberships online and the flexible reporting that the new system would bring. These are the nuts and bolts that have enabled us to do the analysis talked about earlier in relation to the lower incidence of injuries this year. Even with only a third of the data expected for a normal year, the benefits are already becoming apparent. And in, I am excited to see what we can learn when we get more complete data, when we return to jumping proper and how we can apply that knowledge to why we have the turnover of members that we do. Talking of PIMS, it's been an interesting year, especially when it came to the rollout of the online purchase of student provisional memberships, partly due to unforeseen issues with the implementation, aggravated by a delayed uptake from end users, there have been a few teething issues, but our partners Udinet have worked diligently to resolve them and continue to do so. And once again, I cannot thank Graham Spicer enough for all of his efforts. Graham is a volunteer who is the driving force behind the project and not forgetting Adrian for his assistance on the contractuals. Good news, Graham, we should get to start on phase two soon. That includes online incident reporting, which will greatly assist Jeff in his work. PTOs and chief instructors do a great job minimizing risk and injury, but keeping an overall eye on an eye on overall trends is an additional tool that helps them to help us to stay safe, which is good for all of us physically, not to mention financially, keeping our insurance premiums down. Now on to a few of the things our committees have been working on this year. The Membership Development Committee, chaired by Mark Biada, has been working on initiatives to help get over the trickier humps in the journey that might cause people to drop out. They have been working on working with UK coaching for the course content in regards to changing the coaching rating system and first for sports, first for sports to develop a qualification which is aligned to the Chartered Institute of the Management of Sport and Physical Activity and their standards of coach and high performance coach, which means our qualification will have transferable skills across the majority of sports. The plan is to run a pilot scheme for formation skydiving foundation coaches this year and further disciplines and levels will come after that. During this development, all current ratings for coaches will continue, both renewals and issuing of new ratings where appropriate. Thanks to Martin Soulsby, Jeff Montgomery, Tony Butler and volunteer Ben Samuel for their work in this area. Mary Barrett has been chairing a working group looking at how to improve coaching roadshows. After consulting sponsored athletes, it is thought there might be better ways for them to give back rather than the slightly restrictive format of the roadshows, which will now be further investigated and that the link between them could be loosened. This will open up roadshows to other qualified coaches and members who will apply. And the emphasis will focus more on fundamental skills and progressing past the things that might discourage new people from staying in the sport. This was the first year of, for the new elite performance committee and Sam allowed himself to be thrown in the deep end and chaired it despite only having one year previously on council. Discipline reps have evolved into technical excellence advisors, recognised subject matter experts in their field, providing their knowledge and experience to MDC now as well as EPC. What should have been a great year with a record number of coaching roadshows and a full calendar of competitions crumbled under the onslaught of the pandemic. EPC's funding is a discretionary spend that is calculated as a percentage of our surplus, since we have no surplus, having to disinvest some of our reserves. Whilst last year's unclaimed sponsorship has been ring fenced and carried over to this year, it will have to be scaled back in the future until we can recover but we still intend to support our elite athletes and future talent as best we can. 
Sam is unfortunately standing down as chair of EPC. He's had a busy year with work an expanding family and a move to the other end of the country. And he doesn't feel he can dedicate the time required going forward, but will remain on council. Sam's year on council has been almost as unenviable as mine, but thank you for all of your efforts, Sam. Thanks to good governance, nominations for roles such as chairs of committees happen in advance of the initial council meeting now, which happens shortly after the AGM. I'm pleased to say that Mary Barrett has been put forward for the new chair. And as there have been no other nominations will likely be approved by later, approved later by, on by council. Good luck, Mary. The Royal Aero Club is the national air sports control for the United Kingdom and every year awards are given, recognising achievement and service in all forms of aviation. We reported last year that Max Hurd, Dane Kenny and Martin Salisbury were all awarded silver medals for outstanding achievement. Unfortunately, they have not been able to have their accolades bestowed upon them due to the current issues prohibiting public gatherings. Hopefully they will get the chance to get their due recognition amongst their peers this year. Given the limited amount of jumping that has occurred this year, not to mention the backlog of awards that still need to be presented, Council elected not to nominate anyone. So I therefore have no success stories to tell you this year, I'm afraid. The award ceremony is usually held in a grand location, such as the RAF Club in Piccadilly. But there is a lot of standing around, squashed into a stuffy, albeit ornate room, listening to a lot of nominations. But what I wouldn't give to be able to do that right now. Each year, the Royal Aero Club Trust awards bursaries as part of its Flying for Youth programme. These bursaries are for those wishing to advance from one recognised level of air sport to the next, grading system, instructor ratings, etc. Anyone between the ages of 16 up to 21 can, reply, can apply and previous awardees from 21 to 24 can apply for a follow on bursary. This year, I'm ex extremely pleased to say that 16 of the awards went to British skydiving members. The closing date for entry is the 31st of March this year. Application forms will be available on our website and will be reminding you in all the usual places. If you are eligible, I really do recommend that you apply. So a look to the future. What will your council be doing next year and beyond? Yes, we need to plan our next plan since our current plan ends in 2022. But we know it, it's going to be 2023 before we know it. So we'll soon need to start preparing for the next five years. But in the shorter term, we'll likely need to review the guidelines issued last year to ensure that there's still best, practices, best practice in the anticipation of the resumption of jumping. Membership journey, as always a recurring theme but even more important now than ever if we are to build back our membership. The review of STC, riggers, pilots and staffing, as I said earlier. Coaches rating. A lot of the hard work has been done now, but we need to put the plan into action with the pilot programme. And hopefully we get the opportunity to test it. <clears throat> we are currently finalising a few quick sprints to resolve issues on PIMS before we move on to phase two and the incident reporting, which will happen shortly. So last year, Martin had a similar slide and on it he had gender and I've crossed that out and I've updated it this year. It's changed slightly. This item emerged from the dispute over the female category in formation skydiving a couple of years back. You re may remember that less than 20% of, of our membership is female. Council member Kate Lindsley has done some great work putting together the Uncover Your Potential weekend and a female flight course this year, which sadly couldn't run under the British skydiving banner due to COVID limitations. It is hoped that initiatives like this will encourage the underrepresented members of our sports. Plans for an additional female led course have been postponed by, by course, I mean instructor course, um, has been postponed due to the cancellation of instructor courses this year. But it is also taking on a wider scope beyond just gender into the gamut of diversity and inclusivity, 
not just because it's the right thing to do, but it will also assist our strategic goal of the membership journey to increase retention. This is being led by council member Mary Barrett. Another one modified from last year. I'm sure you don't need to, me to tell you that skydiving is not one of the most environmentally friendly supports. And in these woke times, I think we have our work come out, uh, cut out, otherwise we risk becoming socially unacceptable. Whilst this largely affects the sharp end of skydiving, and there are already drop zones that have been working to become sustainable, and undoubtedly more will join them, we have, and we have seen the exciting development of alternatively powered aircraft, but there is much we can do to change attitudes and help get our house in order. Martin made me promise him last year that there would be a phone app. The remedial work that has been required to be undertaken with PIMS this year has pushed this back, but it's still on the list. Finally, after talking about the future, a throwback to the past. Whilst the British Parachute Association was officially incorporated as a not-for-profit company limited by guarantee in 1966, it was formed five years earlier on, on the 20th of October 1961 in a central London cafe. The decision was more to, made to form. Hang on a minute, you might say. Wasn't that 61 years ago? Although the decision was made then, we were still under the auspices of the Royal Aero Club Parachuting Committee and we didn't gain our independence until 1961. Therefore, this year is our 60th anniversary. We very much hope that current events will have subsided enough to be able to enable us to gather and celebrate in the most appropriate way. I've lumbered, I mean tasked, the chair of MDC, Mark Biada, to add the planning of this event to his already very long to-do list. Interestingly, in the photo that was provided by joint founder and first secretary Bernard Green, and is notably our first chair, Mike Riley, who can be seen in the centre. Bernard set up the UK's first commercial parachute centre called British Skydiving Limited at Thruxton. Hmm, catchy name. That brings me to the end of my review. It's been a difficult year, maybe even the worst, for a lot of people. With the tough restrictions and the promise of vaccination, I hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel and we will soon be back jumping again with our friends. Paraphrasing something I heard the other day. Remember that with each day that passes brings us closer to throwing ourselves out of a perfectly good aircraft once more. I look forward to seeing you in person again and I wish everyone a better year than 2020. Cheers. Um, sorry, well, just before I carry on, um, I, I see a comment. Uh, sorry, but how is equality having a women's only event? We need to work together, not divide into groups. Um, that, that, that sadly, whilst I appreciate what you're saying there, um, and there is some truth to it, uh, th that isn't the truth. The feedback that we've had from the the, the, the court of the female courses um, and events is that the environment was generally more encouraging and more positive and was more likely to keep people in in the sport. Um, and and there are benefits to that it's it's an area with with a reduced section of the membership like that um, we, we need to level up. Um, it isn't it isn't about separating. It isn't about splitting. It isn't about division. It's about bringing up the other sections that are not the same. So I hope you appreciate that. We're not dividing. We're leveling up. Sound like a politician there. But thank you for the question. Next, item six, to receive and adopt the annual report and accounts for the year 
ending 30th of June 2020. Just as a reminder, we have three different types of year at British Skydiving. The calendar year around the, which the review revolves, the membership year which runs April to March, and the accounting year which runs June, July to June. We've looked at trying to align them in the past, but I'm afraid it's all a bit difficult. Are there any questions regarding the annual report and accounts? No, nope. okay. For agenda items seven and eight, I'm going to have a break and hand over to our treasurer, Tash Higman. Okay, so agenda item seven is to confirm the reappointment of the auditors and to authorise the council to fix their remuneration for the ensuing financial year. Haynes Watts have been our auditors for a while now, and um, this year particularly we had the changeover of treasurer from Debbie to me and the changeover of finance manager from John Gretton to Lisa Moore and Haynes Watts have been very supportive in providing some continuity and I hope to see that going forward as well um, and hope you will vote in favour of this item. For item eight, um, we pre -record, I pre-recorded a video because my internet connection isn't great and you might already be seeing some audio and um, video sync issues and it would be annoying for all of you to have to suffer through all of that for the whole of this item. However, I do want to answer the question that was asked about the reserves. Um, one of my intentions had been at the outset this time last year is to carry out a review and identify how much we should be having in reserves and then how do we reach that level. My expectation last year had been that we would settle on a number that was lower than what we have in the bank or in our investments and that we would therefore be in a position to spend. Unfortunately, this year, that's slightly different. However, I do still intend to carry out an exercise to understand what is the best level of reserves to hold by looking at what other national governing bodies do and the guidance provided by the Charities Commission, because they are requiring people to um, support and evidence um, why they are holding reserves of the level they do. So there's absolutely an activity that I hope you're able to spend time on this year. Moving on to the actual agenda item eight, the subscriptions payable for full and provisional members for the 12 months beginning the 1st of April 2021. And as I said, we have a video for that. So this is a regular agenda item, and as has been done in the past, I'll now present to you the proposed membership subscriptions for the membership year 2021 to 2022. Um, because the voting process takes longer than when we're in a big hall, I'll use the time while we're waiting for the votes to come in to talk a little bit about the categories of membership and what we will get for our membership subscription. So, as you probably know, the total subscription of the um, is made up of an insurance portion set by our insurer and the British skydiving element. So I'll start with the latter, and I'm sure you'll realise that over the last membership year, we had fewer members in all our categories, well, apart from life members, um, which has reduced their income significantly. We did take steps to reduce our costs, following staff, which are still taking place, and we also made a role redundant. Um, I trust you'll join me in my gratitude to my predecessor, who maintained a very prudent policy of building up reserves over the last couple of decades. This has meant that not only do we have enough savings to tide us over, but we've also been able to provide grants and interest-free loans to affiliated PTOs struggling with their reduced income. But the PTOs in British Skydiving aren't the only people who've suffered a reduction in income during these lockdowns. Many of our members, not only those working in the sport, have also earned less over the last nine months. My proposal, therefore, is to leave the membership subscriptions at exactly the same level as last year. And although I doubt their rationale is the same as mine, the insurers have also confirmed that the insurance premiums will stay the same for 2021-2022. 
Um, you'll see on the table that there's a line here for discounted subscriptions. This is the retrospective discount for all members who renewed by April 2020 that they get when they renew in 2021 to take account of the fact that there was no jumping until June last year. Furthermore, I propose the provisional membership subscriptions are at these levels. And for those who haven't started voting and wanted to see the numbers first, um, you can start voting now. So what do you get for your membership subscription? By joining British Skydiving, every member gets access to two things. The insurance policy entered into by British Skydiving for all its members and membership and related benefits to British Skydiving. The reason you need to be a member of British Skydiving to get access to the insurance is that our insurers understand our safety and operating policies and based on these they're prepared to pay out up to £10 million in the event of a claim. They can't assess the safety approaches of anyone skydiving under, under, under other rules and so they're not prepared to provide this level of cover if you're not jumping at a drop zone affiliated to British Skydiving which is why the cover even for our members outside the UK is not the full 10 million pounds. We do have a small group of members who conduct sport parachuting on, in the course of their employment. And as such, they have employer's liability insurance when they are parachuting. And this explicitly forbids them from making a claim against British Skydiving's insurance. If we were to sell them insurance, we would be breaching financial conduct regulations and we'd be opening ourselves up to mis-selling claims. These members can't claim against British Skydiving's insurance and must make the, any claim they have against their employer's liability insurance. As their employer's liability insurer has not waived the right to counterclaim against our insurance, the employer does pay a collective premium to cover this residual risk, but everyone else pays insurance premium with their membership subscription. That's enough about insurance. I've written a whole article in the mag when you have bad insurance. So if you get any other questions after you've heard this and read that, then just email me. So the other thing that our members get access to is the wider membership services. We have two types of members, those with limited access to our benefits and services and those with full access. The limited access is for temporary members who, for example, can't win our national championships, they can't vote and they can't instruct. The membership is limited to a month and tends to be taken out by visiting licensed skydivers who are spending some time in the UK and want to jump at a British skydiving affiliated drop zone. The remaining membership categories have access to all membership benefits, including voting here at the AGM. I'll talk through them in the order in which most people take them out and explain which of the full membership benefits are the most relevant to the people at each time. We don't try to match the income from any category against the benefit most relevant to them. To do so would increase administrative burden on our staff. and There'd be little, if any, value in employing someone just to do analysis work or asking all our staff to complete timesheets for this purpose. So I'll start with provisional memberships. These are for all our student parachutists. Category system, static line, students, AFF and tandem students. We have many student members and even with a low individual subscription, the total income earned from these members is significant. What these members get from their subscription can be best summarised in the words safety and training, i.e. the work carried out by the technical staff at British Skydiving. All students need instructors. We're extremely fortunate to have a great and dedicated team of volunteer instructor examiners. Without these, we couldn't conduct the instructor training courses that we do. And the fees paid by the course candidates for these courses, by and large, cover the cost of the expenses which are reimbursed to the volunteer instructor examiners. They do not, however, pay for the work carried out by the staff in terms of the overall organisation and administrative preparation by Trudy, as well as the consistent course director in Jeff Montgomery. The big advantage of having a course director who earns his income regardless of the pass rate is that he can focus on competence and safety of the candidates. I'm actually quite proud that some people fail British Skydiving instructor courses. It means that there is a standard and that that standard must be met. 
if a course director's income depends on their reputation and they get a reputation for failing their candidates, they could see their income dry up, leading to them lowering the standards at which they will pass instructor candidates. Of course, for an individual failing, it's disappointing. However, we can confidently say that there is a high and consistent standards are applied to all our instructor candidates. Students, by definition, also don't know that much about how a drop zone works, what is safe and what isn't safe. One of the other activities our safety team conducts is the inspection of drop zones, audits. Jeff and Tony visit affiliated PTOs and ensure that the operations manual is being adhered to. A team which is financially independent of the organisation it is auditing inspires a lot more confidence in their findings. The accountancy profession and government have for years been trying to find out how you go about having an auditor with, who is independent when the organisation being audited pays for their services. Our mechanism, by which the auditors are paid for by the people benefiting from the auditing, retains a healthy distance between the auditors British skydiving and the auditees the PTOs. And this supervision gives new skydivers confidence in the drop zone as being run safely. Being a member of a national governing body shows the commitment the drop zone has to safety and adhering to rules. I can think of a drop zone which is not a member of its national governing body overseas, which has an appalling reputation for safety, including tandems being done by people who don't have instructor ratings. That's not to say that any drop zone not wanting to affiliate to a national governing body is not safe, not at all. However, being under the supervision of the national governing body openly and publicly confirms to inexperienced people in the sport that a venue is committed to safe and rule-bound operations. And this confidence is important. Without it, fewer people may want to jump. Students must have confidence that their PTO is willing, in their PTO, to be willing to do the training and then jump out of the plane. The volume of the provisional members means that they take up a fair amount of time in the office, in the membership department, as well as that of the finance manager. Once an AFF student has completed level one or a category system student reaches their first free fall, they need to take out a full membership. They could take out a temporary one month membership, but most people take out full membership. And although tandem students are unlikely to transition directly from a tandem to a full membership, um, if they decide to take out an AFF or category system course within 12 months or from when they took out their provisional membership, they don't need to pay for it a second time. I assume that most of you watching are full rather than provisional members, although they are just as welcome as anyone else. You have, we have fewer provision, full than provisional members. So to make up a similar income level from this category, the amount per member is higher. But a full member also gets more from British skydiving than provisional members. Of course, we all benefit from the activities of the safety and training team. Some of your instructors, all of us went through instruction, although some possibly outside of British skydiving. After reaching full membership status, the sports related work of British skydiving becomes relevant. The grading system represented by stickers provides a real good structure for learning and developing skills in all disciplines, a common language by which if you move, a new drop zone can have confidence in your abilities. We believe it's one of the reasons why our younger members are usually successful when applying for Royal Aero Club bursaries. And of course, here we also benefit from a slew of volunteers, the technical excellence advisors and the work of chief instructors at the STC. And without the commitment of the staff and the infrastructure British skydiving provides, these groups would not be able to work as well as they do. By infrastructure, I mean the building in Leicester when we're able to meet, currently by having the necessary services to host and run the meetings remotely. Full members also get access to coaching roadshows. The time of the coaching is either volunteered or as part of a sponsorship agreement with the elite athlete, athletes. However, their expenses are covered by membership fees. And it's understandable that the coaches often have to travel quite a distance to the roadshows. If there's a local expert on hand, a PTO is less likely to ask for a roadshow in a particular discipline to take place at their drop zone. I mentioned elite athletes. British skydiving facilitates competitions around the country. 
national championships in all FAI disciplines, UKSL in formation skydiving, and Grand Prix in both canopy formation and accuracy landing. This also costs money. A further set of volunteers, the British skydiving judges, travel to all these competitions and donate their time to enable our competitors to measure their performance. Again, their expenses are covered by British skydiving. And for those who are successful at the national championship, there's a pot of sponsorship money available to support and enable more training to improve performance. Internally, again, the membership subscription cover the cost of membership services and the membership administration so that when you move house, you still get your mag, um, finance as well as communication. While I was writing this, I couldn't quite decide who benefits more from the work of our communications manager. Existing full members now have far more opportunities to learn about what's going on and the activities on Instagram and Facebook support the overall, overall positive visibility of the sport to non-skydiving non-skydivers, encouraging more students. Similarly, I'm not sure who, apart from the teams themselves, of course, is the greatest beneficiary of the administrative work supporting the demo teams, both civilian and military, who are British skydiving registered. Not all the demo teams are, some have their own procedures and are approved directly by the CAA. Coming to the third category of members, life members. They get all of this for life. <laughs> And then finally, there's the retired membership category for those who don't jump or take part in any British skydiving activities like instructing, judging, DZ control, packing or anything like that. This permits them to vote, to get the mag, but does not include insurance as it's not needed. So having gone through what your membership subscriptions pay for, let's see the outcome of the vote. Thank you very much, Madam Treasurer. Uh, so thank you for that summary. Uh, there was a question in the chats from Simon Donnelly asking about notifications for voting. No, no, there are no notifications. So just log in uh, when you can and vote for each of the resolutions, including that one that's just happened, the annual report and accounts. Are there uh, any questions on what Tash just said? No, nope. okay. Item nine, to receive the results of the election. Commiserations to those who were not elected this year, a great selection of candidates with only a limited number of seats available. I do hope that those who were not successful will perhaps volunteer or continue to volunteer their skills for the benefit of the association and perhaps stand again next year. Congratulations to the three who were elected, Rob, Buzz and Ellie. I very much look forward to working with you all next year or this year. Appointment of the INEDs. The independent non-executive directors are a product of good governance. They bring outside experience, provide impartial oversight and a constructive challenge to the board. With Sue Stanhope standing down at the end of her term, her replacement will have the standard three-year term. According to our Articles of Association, in the event of a casual vacancy, as happened at the beginning of last year, the nominations committee shall identify a person to fill that vacancy, but only until the next annual general meeting, at which they shall be eligible for reappointment for the remainder of the term of the office of the director who created that vacancy, which in this case is one year. One of the candidates chosen to fill the seats is Rob Hartley, whose background is in sporting governance with Sport England. And it was that experience that led him to be chosen to fill the casual vacancy and immediately become a director at our last council meeting of 2020. And it's now that we ask him to be reappointed for the remaining year of that term. It is expected that he will be further reappointed at next year's ATM. Joanne Shaw is the candidate nominated for three years. I am very excited by both of these excellent nominees to be joining us and they are raring to go. Any questions? Okay.
So that brings us to the end of the formal proceedings. Voting will remain open for another five minutes whilst we have a short award ceremony. So please, if you haven't done so already, log in uh, and finish up casting your votes. It just leaves me to say that the date of the next AGM is on the 29th of January 2022, when I have no doubt that we will be together again and hopefully the pandemic will be well on the way to being a fading and distant memory and we can re recreate heaving bar scenes such as the one here, 3 a.m. bar scenes such as the one on my slide. Thank you everyone very much. I'm now going to hand over to our vice chair, Adrian, who will do the short award ceremony. Thank you. OK, thank you, Craig. Uh, good morning all. Seems strange doing this virtually without a stage, as you know, I'm very shy about standing uh, up in front of people. But anyway, so on to the awards. With no competitions this year, we, of course, do not have any of the usual UKSL and Grand Prix medals to award. And with the reduction in jumping, we have chosen not to grant most of those honours this year. They include the Jim Crocker Sword for Outstanding Contribution, Instructor of the Year and Tad's Causa Experience Skydiver of the Year. Though we do hope to do so next year, but we are pleased to award the following. The first award is the Mike Forge New Skydiver of the Year. This award is named in honour of BPA member Mike Major Michael Lancaster Forge, who was tragically killed on active service in the Falkland Islands conflict on the 6th of June 1982. Chief or advanced instructors nominate the new skydiver of the year. The criterion used is that a relatively new skydiver is nom nominated who has progressed well during the last year and is also considered to be a valuable member of their club. So the nominee here, and these are the words of the chief instructor. She moved from Italy to work in the UK five years ago, becoming a citizen in 2019. Each weekend, she reminds of all of us at Hinton what it is to dedicate all of one spare time, not only in pursuit of excellence, but as a club member who is passionate about skydiving. Throughout 2019 uh, to 2020, she has made approximately 410 jumps which is certainly remarkable given that she lives in London. Almost every weekend when the centre is open, I see a small tent pit and there waiting at the manifest to ensure she gets on the first load is Fabi. The smile that greets you is the same that appeared on the cover of the Skydive Mag uh, recently. In, uh, so she's a caring to those who need supporting, always interested in acquiring knowledge from anyone who is willing to give it and happy to impart anything she has learned. She might not know it, but Fabi is a very good mentor to those starting out in the sport and in particular to female jumpers. The level of progression in freefall is something I have not readily come across previously. Freestyle is certainly a particularly difficult discipline. Even the basics require a high level of skill. Making look easy is even harder. She self-taught for most of 2019, making solo skydives. It wasn't until others started jumping and filming here did we see that the level she had obtained was wonderful. Fabioga seems to be a natural. Without doubt, the sport has enriched having personalities like hers. I believe she's on track to become a national champion and is a credit to our club and British skydiving. Any ideas who this might be? <laughs> the new skydiver of the year is Fabiola Braoni. Congratulations, Fabi. Sorry we can't give your award in person, but I think you are watching and we'll be sending your award to you as soon as possible. The next award. Please excuse the indulgence while I talk a little about the recipient of the 50 years in the sports certificate. Dave Tilecoat's first jump was at Bembridge, Isle of Wight, UK on the 4th of July 1970. He only did one more that year due to service commitments. Although he managed to squeeze in another nine the following year, again due to army stuff, including his first free fall, which was at Headcorn. In May 1975, he restarted at the Royal Marines at Dunkerswell. He has owned and been CI of two parachute centres, Lincoln and Eaglescote. B 
been an advanced instructor, examiner, rigger, FS coach on three British teams in style and accuracy from 78, 80 and 82. Army team, council member, display team leader. Over the years, he has jumped from 38 different types of aircraft, including seven different types of helicopters in 16 different countries. In August 98, he stopped jumping, having sold Eagle Scope Parachute Centre in Devon, along with his wife, Sue, who also stopped. And they took up running, bodyboarding, cycling and skiing. So they really didn't stop. People say you should never mix your sport with business. Yes, he says, you can agree with that. It gets very tiring being responsible for the safety of others for so long. All his ratings lapsed and he's never been happier, just being one of the crowd. Sue sadly died in December 2013. In May 2015, he started jumping again and has done 903 jumps since restarting. 86 jumps between 14th of November 2019 and the 1st of March 2020, the last time he jumped due to the COVID situation. Congratulations, Dave. We're glad to see you back and going strong. I understand this year will be also marked the 50th anniversaries of Jackie Smith and Jeff Illich too. So moving on to the Star Awards. Now, we know there are many examples of fantastic service within our sport and believe they certainly should be recognised. This is why we ask A licence holders and above to tell us about great service they received from another British skydiving member who was a British skydiving star. Each eligible nomination has been considered by a panel of judges, in fact, the five British skydiving vice presidents. These are prime examples of care and how people are encouraged to stay and progress in the sport. The winners of the British Skydiving Star Awards for 2020 are Eddie Southworth and Richard Cotton. Their nominator is Susie Whitehurst, and the nomination reads as follows. RDZ Tilstock has struggled with availability for FS coaching. Ellie and Rich were brought on board by another coach to help rectify that. They've worked tirelessly to coach a backlog of newly qualified a licensed skydivers to ensure retention in the sport and maximum enjoyment. They both have a lovely nature and excellent coaching abilities and are now putting in place a programme to train new coaches to be able to continue the availability here. They are also providing their expertise and experience free to teach others how to become coaches, including grand school sessions, tunnel time and ongoing support. All this in their spare time from busy work lives and of course their own skydiving fun. Their evident passion for the sport and enthusiasm for the progression of others is contagious and makes them a pleasure to have at the DZ. Okay, we also do have one other, our second winner of a Star Award for 2020. And this is Jimmy McCarthy. The nominator here is Fleur Jones and it reads as follows. Jimmy McCarthy has shown me exceptional care, loyalty and commitment during the time I've been training with him, especially this year. My free fly journey has had its ups and downs, hampered by injuries and then, of course, lockdown. Right, Jimmy has shown me an unwavering support and care, contacted me to check on me, particularly through lockdown, on my mental well-being. He inspires my flying with examples of footage to work towards and helps me get into condition with tips and resources for building the necessary strength and fitness required. This was particularly supported during lockdown where honestly, my incentive to keep myself fit was wavering. His enthusiasm for my progress is motivating and he makes me believe in myself when I can't see it. He pushes me to the next level without me even realising it. He is open to me sharing my ideas of what I want to achieve and together we discuss how we are going to get there. But he's almost very honest about my capabilities and what my thoughts are and that builds trust which is certainly vital. I feel like Jimmy is there for your journey not just to coach you for that 15 minutes or half an hour or just to take your money. It's not just me either, I have seen him with other students too. He is generous with his time for anyone that wants to learn how to be the best flyer they can be. So congratulations to all those guys. Now, as you know, a bit a big part of the expo experience is the seminars that attract presenters and viewers from far and wide. We certainly did consider running them online this year, but I'm afraid it was a bit of a non-starter. However, I'm glad to say that Skydive Langer have stepped up to fill the gap 
and today they are running their Zugi. I'm certainly grateful to them for leaving a gap in the programme for this presentation, so at least we have a few people watching and we haven't completely wasted our time. Once we are done here, I recommend you head over to their Facebook page. And just as a note, uh, we helped uh, market the fact that they were running the Zugi as well, and uh, their Zoom uh, page uh, has actually been oversubscribed so far. So if you can't get on it, do keep trying. They certainly have a number of uh, seminars throughout the day, so check it out. And there is also a bit of tiny partying at the bar, and they are going to be trying to replicate that experience uh, without the queue at the bar. That'll be great if you can. And don't forget, there are dozens of seminars going back to 2015 on the Skydive the Mag YouTube channel. So we'll not spend some time going through these. You may have missed them. Thank you for everyone for your attention and see you next year. But finally, I'd like to thank Epitech and Ali Adams who uh, support us for all our AV at these events, especially through his assistance in the production of this online EGM. Fingers crossed, next year we will all be together at the Expo and have some very exciting ideas. All I can say is, be there, we'll be back in a few minutes with the results of the voting. Thank you.
And we're back. Um, I'll try and be as quick as I can. Apologies, we are overrunning slightly and we're giving Laura at Lang our heart attack because she's pushed the next seminar back already and we've already gone into their starting time. So as quick as we can, here are the results from the resolutions from our partner UK Engage. Resolution one, to receive my highlights of the year, carried uh, 98% for. Resolution number two, to receive and adopt annual report and accounts for last year, almost 99% in favour, carried. Uh, to confirm the reappointment of the auditors and to authorise council to fix their remuneration, 98% for carried, thank you. Resolution four, to set subscriptions payable, full and provisional members for the next 12 months starting April 1st, 2021, 97% in favour, that's carried. Resolution five, to receive the results of the membership selection of elected members for this year, 99% um, that is received. And to receive and vote on the recommendation of our independent non-executive directors, 98% in favour. So that's accepted. Thank you very much, everyone. And enjoy your day. And sorry, Laura. Over to you guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you.
Oh, 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 oh,